Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter. I am your host moderator for the Maker Fair Milwaukee uh, NASA Space Age Makers presentations today. We're really excited to have Dr. Joe Lazio join us. Uh, we got to meet him uh, about a month and a half ago, and uh, he does some really cool stuff. I mean, the the, the math, the science, uh, working with really big instruments and doing stuff millions and millions and millions of miles away, maybe even billions uh, at this point with some of the things that he's working with. And I won't steal his thunder, but um, this is, uh, Joe has been a phenomenal uh, resource for us and, and given us some very interesting stories to, to tell. Um, we are excited to have him. A um, couple of things that we're going to be doing here is uh, we are going to use the Slido uh, function at the, the right of your screen for question and answer. You can put in questions at any time, but we will bank them for the end. Um, the second thing is, is that if you don't want to be recorded, um, please leave your camera off and uh, we'll be okay that way um, as we are recording and we, we will share this out at a, at a later date. Um, so without any further instruction or, or anything else, um, Joe, please take it away. We're really excited to have you here today and, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, I only wish I could actually be in Milwaukee. I, I think that would be a lot more fun, but um, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I've actually had colleagues who have uh, presented work, other work, um, did other things at, at Maker, Film, Maker Fair in Milwaukee. So some of the, sort of a double pleasure. Uh, I thought I'd start first by just, uh, so who is this guy that, that to whom uh, uh, you're listening at the moment? Uh, everybody knows me as Joe. Uh, I actually grew up in Iowa. So those of you, uh, I understand that there might be people from Wisconsin or Minnesota. Um, yeah, I'm from one of those neighboring states. Um, I've always been interested in science. I, I started with dinosaurs and actually I still really like uh, reading some of it. It's not the kind of work that I do. Every so often I, I wonder about whether our house needs a trilobite fossil. Uh, but I somewhere along the line, I got hooked on space and astronomy. And I certainly remember um, before, uh, certainly by the time this picture was taken, which you can see me uh, being recognized as science students of the month at, at my junior high school, uh, I, I had, you know, snuck out of, I think this was a previous house, snuck out of a bedroom window and, and the garage was, uh, the garage roof was just there and I could uh, get out there and look at stars. I think this was also about the time of the space shuttle uh, was getting introduced or the entire concept of the space shuttle was being introduced. So I was fascinated by that aspect of it. Uh, went to the University of Iowa, public university, and then on to the uh, Cornell University spent uh, a little over a decade at the U.S. Naval Research Lab, where interestingly enough, my job title was radio astronomer, which I thought always was really cool because um, I, when I was a boy, when I was about that age, maybe a little earlier, I, I wanted to grow up and be a radio astronomer. And, and for a while, my job title was actually radio astronomer. Uh, about 10 years ago, I got a, an offer to, to move to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, JPL, here in Southern California. And, you know, actually, one of the toughest questions that, that we faced was, should we move to, to Los Angeles? I don't know, uh, you know for folks, um, say, in Milwaukee or Minnesota, uh, Ohio. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, we always sort of assumed that California was about to drop into the ocean. And uh, if you had asked me back in eighth grade, Southern California, I mean, L.A. was, was more than a foreign country, or it was even weirder than a foreign country. Uh, but now that I'm out here, I, I really like it. So what I'd like to I, I'd like to describe is Peter sort of hinted some of the exciting science that we do. Uh, but in order to do this, I want to tell you a little bit first about NASA's deep space network. And I, I always begin try to begin these presentations with noting I have the privilege of talking to you about some of the exciting science and maybe some of the underlying engineering. But there's really a whole team of people, engineers. Uh, other scientists who, who work on this, this network and keep it running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and, and for more than 50 years. Okay, so 
Uh, let me start by actually starting asking a slightly different question, which is I hope all of you have seen these really exciting pictures that have come down from the Perseverance rover. Uh, this shows a, a rock on Mars and Perseverance has drill and a, uh, drilled a hole into it. And you may know that one of the objectives of the Perseverance ro rover is to collect little samples. Uh, and you see one in the lower right. Uh, the, the rover actually picks up material, puts it in something that's about the size of a test tube, seals it up, and then the idea is that a subsequent rover and an ascent vehicle are going to go retrieve those and bring those samples back to Earth so that scientists here on Earth can actually uh, study material, on, pristine material from, from Mars. All sounds really exciting, right? If, if nothing else, it's going to be uh, the first time launching a rocket on another planet. But let me ask a slightly different question. Which is, how did we get these pictures? How are we actually able to see these pictures? Clearly the rover had to take a picture or take several pictures, but it then had to transmit those pictures back to Earth. How did we get those pictures here on Earth? And I'm gonna gloss over some of the technical details of actually almost something like an internet on Mars or something kind of close, but at the other end on Earth was NASA's Deep Space Network. So the Deep Space Network is a complex of three radio antennas uh, located around the world. There are three complexes and each complex has multiple antennas at it. And you can see that uh, one of the complexes is outside Madrid, Spain, the capital of, uh, capital of Spain. Um, and I hope I'm still sharing. Uh, Goldstone, California, which is kind of about uh, three hours up the road behind me, and then outside Canberra, Australia. Uh, and why do we have, why does NASA have three of these complexes? Well, imagine yourself, uh, imagine yourself at your favorite planet. What you can tell is that no matter where you are, where you think you might be in the solar system or even beyond it, this, because we have a couple of spacecraft now, the Voyager spacecraft that are outside the solar system, no matter where you are, you can always see one or more antennas of the deep space network. So if we need to command, if we need to send a command up to a spacecraft or we need to receive data down, we always have one or more antennas that, that is available to do that. So Pete, I think now is the time, let's run the first poll. Uh, the question, well, yeah, run the first poll. It should yeah. be up now. So the question is, how many missions is it that do you think the Deep Space Network is enabling this week? And we'll give people uh, maybe a couple seconds. I hope it just, you know, type out a number, think, you know, put a number in of what you think it might be. Do, do, do. We need we need some background music here, right? Going once, going twice. I th uh, does this mean we have one answer, Pete? Yeah, it looks like one answer. We got some sh shy folks here. Yeah. Uh, we got we got a couple groups that just uh, dodged in and out, so. Um, Maybe well, give them three more seconds, uh, Jorge and and uh, this Cridler's class, Tracy. If you want to answer, that'd be great. How many of those missions are out there right now? Going once, twice. Actually, everybody uh, everybody shot. knows it has to be more than one, right? Because I've already talked about one. Well, what if we what if we go on, and uh, let me see if I can actually it's there. So the answer is about three dozen, and you see here, uh, I believe this is an up to date list of all the missions that that the DSN, um, you know, we call it the DSN, everything in NASA is an acronym, of course. Uh, these are the missions that that the DSN is enabling. Uh, I say about three dozen because, of course, from week to week, it might vary a little bit. And if you look, uh, some of these missions, for instance, the Artemis mission on the far uh, left and um, my screen is a little bit. Um, somewhere in here, you might also see an MMS mission, the Magnetospheric Multiscale. It has four spacecraft. So the number of missions and the number of spacecraft is not identical. but 
And any given week, it's about three dozen uh, missions that that the DSN is enabling all across the solar system. And and even uh, in the upper left, there are two that are outside the solar system, and the New Horizons is on its way out. Uh, the other thing, this is NASA's deep space network. NASA constructed it, and um, JPL operates it on behalf of NASA. But if you look at these missions, if you look at, say, the upper right, there's Mars TGO, which stands for the Trace Gas Observer. That's actually a European mission. It's launched by our partners at the European Space Agency. Uh, in the middle of the of this little slide, you see the Ak Akatsuki and the Hayabusa 2 missions. Those are both Japanese missions launched, launched by our partners at the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. And you see, uh, let's see, in the top right, there is this mission that seems to be affectionately called MOM, the, the Mars Orbiter mission. That's actually our partners at the Indian Space Research Organization. And on the lower right, uh, lower left, rather, you see the latest entry, the Emirates Mars mission, which is some, sometimes called HOPE, uh, or also called HOPE uh, by the United Arab Emirates. So on the one hand, it's NASA's deep space network. On the other hand, we're enabling uh, exploration across the solar system and beyond for, for all of humanity. Okay, so that's the DSN, and, and you can see our tagline, right? Don't leave Earth without us. Uh, there is also, if you want, don't do it at the moment, but but uh, if you want, you can do a quick web search on something called Deep Space Network Now, DSN Now, and it shows you what's happening right this moment. I took this screen capture earlier this morning, and you can see that at each complex, there is a, a big antenna, a 70 meter antenna, and then multiple small antennas where a small antenna to us is 34 meters across. Uh, you can see the three complexes, Madrid, Goldstone, Canberra. You can see, for instance, at the time I took this picture earlier this morning, uh, the 70 meter in Madrid was actually receiving data from Voyager 1 outside the solar system. Uh, if you look at it carefully, you can see that, in fact, uh, Madrid and Goldstone both have uh, some Mars missions lined up. So the uh, antenna 55 is receiving data from some Mars missions, and antenna 25 is getting ready to. That's a reflection of the handoff that's about that well, at the time was about to occur, in which Mars was setting for Madrid. It was rising for Goldstone, so they were going to hand off and keep the data flowing. Okay, so I threw around some numbers. Uh, time for the second poll. Um, I think it's a multiple choice one, Pete. How big do people think 70 meters is? Can you can we relate that to uh, our every as it were everyday life? So how big? And let's see. And I think uh, does it show the multiple choice? And I I didn't put in the multiple choice. Ah. I left it as a free response. Okay. How, how big so compare it to uh, some things you might know. How big do you think 70 meters is? Going once, going twice. Well, as you said, Pete, we may have some some shy folks, or it's taping, taking a long time to to up. Oh, here we have one. Although, actually, not sure I can see the results. Do you want to? Uh, what's the, what's the first answer we have? First answer is is it as big as Big Ben in London? Ah, that's the, a uh, scale size. Um, you know that's a good question. I don't actually know quite how tall Big Ben is, but I'm pretty sure that Big Ben could fit comfortably within a 70 meter. In fact, you could probably put uh, multiple. And now I know you could put multiple Big Bens. Uh, or Statues of Liberty within a 70 meter. We got a second answer. Bigger than a medium sized house. Hmm. Yep. Keep going. Keep going bigger. Going. Any other? Uh, yeah, the uh, third. A 30 storage building. So like 30 storage units. Uh. If if I know what size is being described there, yep, we could fit many many such storage buildings in there. Um, how about I'll I'll tell you it is it is nearly big enough that the Milwaukee Brewers could play a a, ba a baseball game in it. 
Um, 70 meters is about the size of, of a, it's, it's a, a just slightly smaller. It's a, just about the size of a, a regulation major league baseball uh, field. Uh, it's slightly smaller than say your high school football team, uh, football field. So you could very easily uh, put a lot of stuff. And the reason that we, we need such large antennas is precisely if you look at this, for instance, Voyager 1, uh, Voyager 1 is so far out, the signal is so faint that the only way we can receive it is by having a very big antenna. In fact, uh, you know, it's common, it would take um, something like the age of the universe. By, by observing Voyager 1 for the age of the universe, we could turn on your, your refrigerator light for uh, something like 30 seconds. Okay, so I, I mentioned earlier, in fact, if, you, if I were to go into a bit more detail here, in fact, sometimes the DSN sends commands out to spacecraft. So if we can transmit, uh, one of the science things we can do is called planetary radar. We can actually transmit from an antenna, not toward a spacecraft, but toward a natural body in the solar system. And I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about asteroids, but you see here the idea, and there's actually some very fundamental physics, uh, science that goes into this, uh, as well as a lot of engineering, um, the antenna will transmit, transmit, it then reflects off the target, which might be an ast, let's, let's say, because these days most of our targets are asteroids. Um, it reflects off the target and then it comes back. And in fact, again, these are very weak signals. Um, so it would take, um, uh, actually, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, but it's like, a billionth of a billionth of a watt, which in other words, if you had, it would take, um, you would have to collect these signals for multiple years in order to get an enough power to actually run say a hundred watt light bulb in your own house. That's how faint the signals are coming back. And therefore, uh, as well, all of the engineering that is required to transmit powerful enough signals so that even after they're reflected, we receive them. In fact, if I had more time, I could go in. It's, it's, it's bleeding edge engineering to actually get some of these systems to work for, for some of these radar system, these radar observations, because the, the tolerances are so tight and the power levels are so high that, that actually getting it to work is, is bleeding edge electro, uh, electronics and engineering. Okay, so why do we actually do this? Well, one reason is the science. Uh, asteroids, and again, most of the targets are asteroids these days. Asteroids are kind of the debris left over from when the solar system formed. So by looking at asteroids, we're sort of getting a snapshot of what was left over at the end of the formation of our own solar system. Uh, you can also see here, this is now a movie, uh, a movie made from multiple observations of an asteroid. Uh, there is structure, actually I should point out, uh, I should point out, these are weird images, or this is a weird movie. You should imagine yourself being at the top of the image. So this is kind of, or sorry, the earth rather, is at the top of the image, and you're seeing a top-down view of the asteroid. And what you can see is, first off, the asteroid isn't round, right? It's clearly got shape. And in fact, there are bright spots that show up, or bright ridges. There's, these asteroids have uh, geology. They have geography of actually ridges and hills. Uh, I don't, this picture doesn't show it, but we have others. You can actually distinguish individual boulders. Uh, another reason that, that we use radar observations, and this is very important for some of NASA's missions, is if you want to, if you want to send a spacecraft to, say, an asteroid, and for instance, NASA did this recently with um, the, uh, the asteroid Bennu, and uh, Japan did it recently with Hayabusa, you have to know where the asteroid is. You have to know what its or orbit is. So how do you get that? We do that with radar. We get very precise orbits by illuminating these asteroids. In fact, one of the reasons that, that there is even a radar system in, in the DSN is that in the very early days of space exploration, we didn't know the size of the, of the solar system well enough to send spacecraft across the solar system. So one of the first things that was done was just measure how far, how long it takes a radio wave to go from Earth to Venus and back, and that gave us an, an actual number of meters from which you could, uh, from which uh, the people at the time could design subsequent inter, uh, interplanetary missions. The final reason, and it's come somewhat connected to this orbit determination, that is, 
measuring where the what the the orbit of of an asteroid is very precisely uh, is shown in the upper right. So this is an asteroid that actually hit the Earth, or it's actually it's the trail left over after an astro as an asteroid was coming in to hit the Earth. Uh, this was a, a a small asteroid that hit the Earth um, near the city of Chelyabinsk, Russia, Russia in 2013. Now this is a it's a small asteroid. It's on a scale of about 20 meters. Uh, so that means 20 meters, to put that in context, if you go to, say, your high school gymnasium or something like that, a 20 meter asteroid will probably fit well within your high school gymnasium. Um, but nonetheless, it, it actually blew out as as it flew overhead or as it came in overhead, the sonic, uh, the sonic boom blew out a bunch of windows and caused some damage. Fortunately, nobody was injured. Uh, actually, nobody was killed. There were people who were, suffered injuries from glass. Uh, but one of the reasons we do these radar is exactly to track precisely what the orbits of these asteroids are, and that gives us advance warning should we ever need it. Unfortunately, we don't, or we don't know of it yet. We know of no asteroids that, that are on target for Earth, but, but we constantly, you know, whenever an asteroid comes close, we're always watching, uh, if we can, with the radar to, to track what is the orbit, determine the orbit, and then predict outward. We want to know, okay, it missed the Earth this time. Can we predict for it? And actually, with radar, sometimes it's possible the orbits are so precisely determined, uh, one can make a prediction, say, centuries out, that we're safe from this asteroid. Um, let's see. So, how do we? Uh, I should acknowledge here too that the DSN is is not the only player in this game. So. The picture on the left is the DSN antenna at Goldstone, the 70 meter antenna at Goldstone that is outfitted with one of these radar systems. It's the one that's actually be virtually behind my head. We've done a little bit of work with the uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, 70 meter at, at Canberra, and we do that with our partners at the Australia Telescope Compact Array, the 70 meter at Canberra transmits, and then the Australia Telescope uh, Compact Array receives. The Green Bank uh, Telescope, which is in West Virginia, uh, sometimes also serves as a as a receiver for the Goldstone system, and until last year, Arecibo was also used. Uh, but these are all fascinating systems, and I think this might also be the time for another poll. Um, Peter, can you or Pete, can you pop up uh, one of the questions that you might have about asteroids? Some of the science questions, actually, some of the science discoveries. Yeah, can asteroids have moods? What do you think? Uh, true or false? What do you think? Can they? Okay, see a few. Going once, give people another minute, 30 seconds or something. Yeah, we got two votes for true and no vote votes for false. Okay, well, let's see. That is in fact the case. Um, so actually, before I run the movie on the left, let me start with the, the one on the right, or sorry, before I run the movie, I guess on the right, the one on the left, uh, here's an, an image of, uh, or a series of images of an asteroid. You can see the, the description of it, 2017 BQ6. When the press release came out, this was compared to a Dungeon and Dragon die. And I'm, I'm not a geologist. Um, not a planetary geologist, but it is remarkable how sharp the faces are on that asteroid. And I don't think anybody quite understands how do you get uh, such sharp faces. Uh, now, as as uh, people responded correctly, in fact, some asteroids about actually about 15%, maybe as many as 20% of asteroids have moons. Almost all of those have been discovered with radar. So you see this uh, this particular asteroid which you can see the, the big asteroid itself, which was the original target of the observations is, is the thing closer to the top of the movie. But you see this little bright speck that's moving. That's, in a, uh, that's a moon actually. And I'll gloss over some of the details, but uh, these, these are very important in terms of being able to get us a mass of an asteroid because it's actually very difficult to get a mass. And then that tells us something about what's on the inside. Okay. Uh, one of the other examples, uh, for instance, uh, give you a heads up. Apophis is an asteroid that is coming by the Earth 
on in 2029, April 13th, and you're giving the uh, you're getting the heads up that it's going to come by. It's going to be a really big deal because this is a big asteroid coming relatively close. We know it's in fact we know it's not going to collide because of some recent radar observations. So here you see these were earlier this year. The the radar observations are earlier this year. And they don't look like much, maybe. You can see where the it's been circled to sort of guide your eye of the various observations. But these radar observations were so precise that we now know where the asteroid was at 10 meter precision. So well within the asteroid itself, we know how well it's positioned. And that allows us to predict it's gonna pass harmlessly by in 2029, not a concern. Here's an illustration of, in fact, um, you can see the orbit of the moon. Apophis is going to come in, sweep by the Earth. The little colored things there are where there's the possibility to get radar tracks, either from Goldstone, the 70 meter at Goldstone, or from the 70 meter at Canberra. So you can see it's going to be fantastic. In fact, people are talking about uh, sending spacecraft to rendezvous with it because it's going to come. Some it's going to be a spectacular opportunity. Of course, the fact that it happens on Friday, the 13th, I'm sure is going to generate lots of of press, but you heard it here first. I hope you heard it here first. You know, it's going to come by. It's going to be harmless, but it's going to be a spectacular show. And, you know, maybe some of you will be actually at the stage. You'll be at an undergraduate or something. You, you'd have an opportunity to participate in some of the science that, that happens either during the event or, or shortly thereafter. Uh, one of the other things that, that we do with, with radar as well, and this becomes more important in terms of NASA and returning to the moon, is we can... Uh, let me see if I can stop this for a moment. So this is actually something that was done with um, uh, our partners at the Green Bank Telescope. Goldstone was transmitting, Green Bank was uh, receiving, and the Chandrayaan-1 was a spacecraft that everybody thought had crashed into the surface of the moon. And there were good, there were good reasons for thinking that it probably had crashed. Uh, but some folks at JPL decided, well, they looked at the orbit and they could predict forward uh, from when the, the orbit was last known. And so what they did was they started transmitting with the Goldstone system. And what you can see here is the orbit track. And the thing in the upper right is now what the radar received. And you can see this peak. Sometimes it's not there and then it shoots up and moves along. So that's actually the Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft moving through the transmissions of the Goldstone radar system and then being received by, by Green Bank. So in fact, it was still in orbit. Uh, we recovered the orbit or the, the team at, at JPL recovered the orbit of, of Chandrayaan-1. And this also becomes important from the standpoint of NASA, being able to keep track of what spacecraft might be orbiting the moon as we send humans back to, to the moon or back to the, the lunar environment. Uh, this is another capability that, that we have for just making sure that we understand everything around. There's also some interesting science. There are asteroids, small asteroids that people, that we know of a couple actually, called mini moons that sometimes temporarily get captured by the Earth for short intervals. And so those might be interesting targets to study with radar and then possibly with spacecraft someday. Uh, so I think that, and, and I hope we set it up so that there is time for some questions. Uh, I could go on and on, but I hope I've given you a taste of some of the fantastic science and the underlying engineering that goes into making radar observations with NASA's Deep Space Network and the bigger picture. Thank you. Joe, that is so cool. I mean, to to do what you're doing in terms of the, the Deep Space Network, that you're talking to all of these missions out in the solar system, but you've also got this technology that's uh, literally protecting Earth from asteroid collisions and making those predictions. Uh, truly amazing. It, to use this technology in multiple ways is, is pretty cool. Um, as, uh, as you asked, and definitely we have time for questions. Uh, we've got a, a good uh, 10 or 15 minutes of, of Q&A. Um, we had a, a question that popped up in one of the, the actually in the poll, um, was just how long have you worked for NASA? I think you addressed it kind of at the, the beginning before the class jumped on, but how long have you worked for NASA? I've been at JPL, uh, let's see, this is 2021. So actually this is September. Um, so I've been at JPL just a little over 11 years, almost uh, you know, to within a couple weeks of 11 years now. Um, and if they jumped on before my my introduction of myself, yeah, it's um, uh, uh, 
moving to JDPL was the entire, it was not someplace I had initially wanted to work. I uh, never thought it, never dreamt of, of working there. And yet now that I'm here and, and working with JPL and assets, like, oh, wow, this is a lot of fun. Super, super. Um, so we have a question from, from Isabel here. I'm going to promote that to the, the live Q&A here. Uh, for the students taking physics, what are the topics in physics that you are, you know, domains that you're working with in physics? Um, Physics is such a broad field of study. What are the, the bits and pieces of physics that you work with? As you might imagine, um, there is a lot of electricity. Well, actually, radio waves are really just a, another form of light, uh, or you can say that the way I would say it more precisely is light is is one kind of electromagnetic radiation. Um, so that means oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And we're all familiar with light because that's what our eyes see. But for instance, ultraviolet light, uh, if you spent too much time in the sun, you get a sunburn because the sun also emits ultraviolet light. Well, that's a, the way I often describe it is that's a color of light that our eyes don't see. There's infrared light, uh, which we know more often sometimes as heat. Uh, radio waves are simply infrared is a color that's more red than red, and then you just keep going uh, and you eventually get to, well, you go to far infrared and millimeter wavelengths and then radio waves. So I didn't actually say the radio waves that are used by our radar systems, they're about four centimeters. So I'm not sure if you can see my fingers being held apart, but you know, it's, it's something you can actually, in some sense, four, four centimeters about the way you can see. Uh, other colors of light, um, you know, ultraviolet is kind of light that's more purple or more violet than, than violet. And then if you keep going, you get to x-rays. If you keep going to shorter wavelengths, you get to x-rays, which if you've ever had an x-ray because you might have had a broken bone or something like that, that's just another way of form of light. And then there's finally gamma rays. Um, so all kinds of that comes into play. Uh, in part because of the radio waves, but then sometimes they get translated into different uh, frequencies or, or different wavelengths. Um, and, and part of the reason I went through the spectrum as well is my background is, in a, as, is as an astronomer. So from an astronomy standpoint, we always want to look outward into the, the universe with all these different colors of light because we get a, a better picture of the universe. So there's a lot of electricity and magnetism, uh, optics. These are in some sense, telescopes. Um, so designing actually how the radio waves bounce off the surface, there's an aspect of just designing a telescope, um, bouncing it off of a, a an asteroid. There's some very fundamental physics that goes into that. I mean, at some level, just engineering is kind of applied physics. So all of the mechanical details of, for instance, modeling the gravity on one of these dishes and then modeling the gravitational force as the dish tips and being able to compensate for that or know what it is. There's an aspect of, well, uh, gravity and forces and mechanical engineering that all goes into that. Um, it's, I mean, anybody studying physics, I recommend you continue. That that was my, my undergraduate degree at, at the University of Iowa is physics. And um, I think if you do physics, you can do almost anything. Isabel's giving big thumbs up over here <laughs> in the, <laughs> the producer's chair. Um, and again, for everybody who's joined us, uh, feel free to, to type in a question in the Q&A uh, part uh, on the right side. More than happy to, to, to take more questions here. Um, I have a question about the, the teamwork aspect of what you do at, at, at NASA. It, it really... Um, the way you describe all these locations around the world, that there's actually kind of like a, a super teamwork because you've got not your NASA people, not only the NASA people, but you've got international uh, partners to, to deal with. Can you talk a little bit about the teamwork of the science and everything that you're doing? What What is that like? It's a both incredibly important and uh, increasingly common 
part of, of the science. Um, and this is particularly in, in physics and astronomy, if you go back into last century, there was a tradition of maybe one person in a lab or a small, small person, you know, small group in a lab. Uh, and these days, the scale of the experiments has actually has, has become sufficiently large that you just have to work uh, in, um, in teams. And it's also important, there, there's an aspect of if you have a team and particularly if you have people with different backgrounds, then sometimes you can find solutions that one person alone won't be able to, to identify. So there's, there's actually an advantage uh, to having teams. Now, there's also a, comp a complication, right? You've got to make sure that uh, everybody um, is able to talk together and, you know, ha it, a, a larger part of my day sometimes seems to be taken up with just making sure that we're setting up the meeting so that everybody can, can participate. Um, there's there's an important aspect of language that, for instance, sometimes an engineer will use a term differently than the physicist will, and making sure that when I say polarization, you know what I mean by that word. Uh, but by and large, it's there's almost nothing anymore that that is done. Certainly not in the deep deep space network and all of these missions. There are uh, lots and lots of people. I'm. One of the other things I'm doing is I am involved in a, a NASA mission, um, and it's six small spacecraft. And you sort of think, well, it's a small mission. Their spacecraft are small, but it's it's got to be a team of 50 to 100 people just to pull everything together because things ended up being that complex. Wow, wow, that's uh, those are big teams, and you know, we think of. Uh, stu our students in the classroom, and they've got uh, 20, 25, 30 uh, classmates uh, doing things, but you're working on a, a, another double and tripling size uh, team. That's uh, uh, pretty common for scientists and engineers these days. Uh, and I, I didn't, yeah, I, actually, I didn't think about it, but you, you raised a good point of if you look around your classroom and you've got, say, 20 people or something, I'm, okay. Imagine all 20 of you are trying to get to the same goal. Um, so you've all got to work together as a team. And how do you actually do that? And making, you know, making sure that everybody is actually uh, using the same same words to mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk talk a little bit about the the science and, and and what you do. What's the most exciting, interesting part of your your job? If you could spend um, eight hours, nine hours a day, maybe more, studying one particular thing, what would you be studying right now for NASA or just for your own uh, your own interest? We set you up in your own lab. Um, it's actually, um, I, I will confess it's not a radar project. I do have some data from from a radio telescope that is partially reduced, and uh, I would really like to get that reduced. In fact, I've been working with an undergraduate student over the past couple of summers, um, and actually, you know, teams. It's a it's a small team in this sense, but I'd really like to get, you know, pull all of that together and and get those uh, those data fully reduced and and the images made. Um, I have to confess, though, one of the uh, one of the things that fascinates me about my job is the ability to or one of the you know really attractive things is the ability to jump from all kinds of different things so we're talking today you know right now about big antennas and radar but uh earlier this morning i was talking about uh in a, in a meeting with a group of about a dozen people uh setting up a a conference to discuss a future telescope and uh, another um Another meeting earlier today with a group of about a half dozen people looking at a specific science question for a future radio telescope in space. And um, I have a subsequent meeting with somebody I'm, I'm working with yet this afternoon to talk about extrasolar planets. So this, uh, this aspect of dancing between various things um, is one of, 
that frankly, it's one of the things I find attractive, both about my current position and I think about J, certainly about JPL. Super. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always fun to have that diversity of things going on in your uh, your work here. Um, Isabel sends in a, another question here. Um, the the you've got all these missions kind of out there. Um, what are the sensors out there that are collecting data? Do, what kind of information are you getting back? It, um, you get kind of fascinated. You shared a, a photo uh, at the beginning of your your um, presentation, but what else is coming back on those uh, uh, riding the data back to Earth? Ah, yes. Um, well, actually, in that sense, uh, my earlier explanation of of the electromagnetic spectrum was was good then because. Uh, the kinds of instruments that are sent out on spacecraft span at least that entire range. Um, there are gamma ray spectrometers that are used, or pretty sure they're gamma ray, both gamma ray and neutron um, instruments that are used, for instance, to detect how much water there is on uh, something like the Earth's moon or an asteroid. Um, X rays. Uh, what a couple of the, if I go back to those mission lists, a couple of the uh, spacecraft or a couple of missions for which the DSN is is receiving data are X-ray spacecraft, X-ray telescopes. Um, there's of course uh, visible light, infrared radiation. There, NASA will be is in the process of designing or or NASA has charged JPL and the Arizona State University, uh, Arizona State University with sorry, University of Arizona, with designing a infrared spacecraft or a, tele, a, a spacecraft with an infrared telescope on it to search for near-Earth asteroids. Uh, Juno, which is the, the mission orbiting Jupiter, has a microwave, which is otherwise known as a ra uh, radio. It's a radio instrument on it that is actually being observed, being used to penetrate at least the upper layer of clouds at, at Jupiter. Uh, in the future, and in some sense, actually, carry both curiosity and perseverance, the, the rovers on Mars, they are actually starting to carry little chemical labs. So you actually, the, the rovers are possibly, you know, the rovers can pick up material, dump it into something, do some analysis as if it was a chemical lab here on, on Earth. So it's a whole range of everything from looking at the kinds of light, uh, the kinds of electromagnetic radiation, to actually sampling what what kind of composition uh, a material is or trying to figure out what it's made of and what might be in there. And of course, in the future, uh, one of the other sensors that, that people are very excited about sending is something that would actually be able to say, watch a puddle of water collected on the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa and see if there's anything moving in it. Cool, very cool. Um, we, have, we have time for one more question. Um, and, uh, while we're waiting for that question to, to come in, um, we wanted to thank you for your time and your expertise. Um, you are really, it, it just, it's brilliant all the time to talk to you and the kinds of things that you're, you're involved with. Um, we wanted to thank, uh, you know, on behalf of the, the Maker Fair Milwaukee Gearbox Labs, and then also thank the Office of STEM Engagement for making all these connections. Uh, when they found you for us, uh, we were super excited to, to have you as part of our, our family here. Um, the, uh, so our last question comes in, uh, Isabel's uh, just fascinated by, by your work. So here, <laughs> so um, she asked that the study of hydrogen atoms is important in astrophysics um, and can you talk a little bit about what uh, what the hydrogen atom? It's, it's such a simple atom, but it, it seems to be pretty important. Um, we know you've done some some work in in hydrogen. Yeah, hydrogen hydrogen is important for no other reason that it is the most common atom in the universe. Um, it is the raw material out of which all stars will form. Uh, the sun, uh, let's see, the sun uh, is essentially a big ball. It's, it's 
really a big ball of, of hydrogen that's hot enough to glow. And then there's a smattering, I guess it's got some helium, it's got about 25% helium. And then there's a smattering of other little, you know, other minor elements in it. But hydrogen is pervasive. Um, it's also in, in, for instance, in the solar system context, uh, one of the ways of, of finding water is to go looking for hydrogen because water is H2O. Um, yeah, so everything from tracing, hydrogen is such a fundamental part of the Milky Way galaxy that by studying where the hydrogen is in the Milky Way, we actually, that was one of the first really good maps we had of our home galaxy. Uh, it's used to figure out or, or track, uh, watch how stars are forming, or at least see the first hints of how stars are forming. Um, it is possibly one of the things that would be, you know, I'd like like to be able to do sometime, uh, but it's going to probably take a while. Is is you can look at how the first stars affected the surrounding hydrogen. And possibly even see back into the the history of the universe before the first stars formed. Uh, the cosmic microwave background is the glow that's left over from from the Big Bang in some sense, but it really formed when the universe cooled down enough that hydrogen atoms could form. So, yeah, if you understand hydrogen, um, and it's been fundamental from a physics standpoint. Isabel asked earlier about physics. Just figuring out the physics of the hydrogen atom took 50, 50 some years because it's, you think, yeah, it's really simple, but there's a lot of physics that goes into even just a single proton and a single electron. She, she's just, just fascinated here. The, the conversation in the, the producer's booth here is super. <laughs> um, any, any final bits of wisdom for Everybody watching us or, or watching on the, the recording. Do you have any other uh, bits of wisdom to share for us? Um, well, I guess 1 of the 1 of the questions actually. Um, 2 of the questions that I get asked frequently, you know, what do I study in school and Isabella sort of hinted at it. Uh, they're, they're kind of, uh, I certainly recommend math. Uh, if, if you get to a point where a high school has physics. Yeah, definitely. Um, actually. Taking, if you have a chance to do something in drama or do something with English, there's an amazing, I never realized this, an amazing part of my job is simply giving presentations to my colleagues and being able to describe an idea is incredibly important and will serve you well. Um, the other question I get asked a lot, and, and maybe this is may, maybe more for the high schoolers, you know, where do I go to school? Um, I indicated I went to the University of Iowa. It's a public university, uh, state public university. I, I would still recommend you should, you know, I would certainly still recommend the University of Iowa, but more importantly is you're going to be at a university for four years. Go someplace that suits you. If you grew up in a small town in Wisconsin or Minnesota, maybe um, a university in a big city is exactly the thing you want, and maybe it isn't. Maybe a small university or a college would be better, but you can get a very good education at any number of places. You don't necessarily have to go to the techs and the so on and so forth, uh, particularly for an undergraduate. It's much more important to get a good solid background in math and physics and some English uh, as a high schooler and, and into college. Awesome. It's a great, great wisdom. We really appreciate that. Um, so, on behalf of all of us, thank you, Joe. We really appreciate uh, all your time again, and um, uh, we will uh, look what we do. We look forward to working with you more uh, in, in the future. But thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend, uh, and uh, we will. Uh, we have one more uh, in this series, actually, a little bit later this afternoon. So uh, hopefully, you can come back and join us for uh, Janelle Wellens, who's also from JPL. So thank you much. Take care. You bet. Ciao. Bye.